Welcome back friends. I have with me here my friend Pam Fields from the Mom Next Door podcast and I hope that you just enjoy her story about the seasons of sewing that she has had over the years with her nine children and just want to invite you if you aren't already to sign up for my newsletter. I've added um, a new section just this week about sewing through the scriptures, which also has to do with my um, upcoming book that will be coming out in the fall of um, 2024, which is tentatively entitled Stitching Your Story, um, a 13-week journey, um, allowing God to sew you piece by piece. And that um, is a play on words in terms of allowing God to sew his piece, P-E-A-C-E, into our lives in um, contrast to fear and anxiety and just my own struggle with that, um, in part from some of the narrative that I had from my years growing up and father loss, etc. So I would love to see you over on my newsletter and um, just enjoy this conversation that I'm having with Pam here. Welcome. So I am here today with my friend Pam and she is the host of the Mom Next Door podcast, which is how I met her. And as I was talking to her when I was on her podcast, I found she had some sewing stories. So I wanted to bring her on to share some of them. Um, so Pam, go ahead and introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about you and where you're from. Well, uh, originally from West Coast, we moved to Tennessee three years ago. And uh, so yeah, Tennessee is where I'm from. I'm the mom of nine and grandma to four. And so they've kept me busy through the years. And that has probably influenced my sewing life for sure. I'm sure that it has. You probably had lots of clothes to mend for starters. Yeah, that's that's definitely a part of it. So I'm curious. I know that you sew now, but when did you learn to sew? How did that start? I was thinking about that since we started talking about doing this. And I remember as a little girl, and I can't think of how old I was, but finding these little scraps of, of fabric, like cut out little squares. And I remember sewing uh, pom-poms onto them to make faces. <laughs> so like, what did I do with them? I have no idea. Where did they go? What was their purpose? No idea. But I just remember these little pom-poms. Um turning them into faces. And then, um, and I don't, I don't know who taught me. I, I do remember somebody teaching me to like, uh, make the knot by taking the thread and crossing it across my finger and using the needle to like roll through. So I do remember some of those things. And, um, by junior high, I remember I made a red tartan plaid skirt and bibbed like, bodice, uh, what do you call it? A pinafore. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it had little buttons at the waist where I could wear it with the pinafore, without the pinafore. Um, that was, you know, another junior high-ish kind of memory. Now, at the point when you made that, were you making it with a sewing machine or did you make the whole thing by hand? M with the machine. Okay. Yeah. And I don't know where that transfer went. Like, how did I learn to to you to use a pattern. Um, I remember there was like probably junior high sewing class. I'm pretty sure there was. Mm -hmm. And so I think they taught me how to sew with the pattern, how to read it and, you know, what the little, all the tools, the little, I can't think of what it's called, like a pizza cutter with the bumps yes. to do the tracing a paper. tracing wheel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I remember um, learning how to do all of those like doing it the right way, which was probably very good in retrospect, because I think I've been more uh, winging it for a lot of my life doing things. But those foundational skills through learning to use the the pattern and to read the back of the pattern and the different types of fabric, you know, that was just beneficial to set me up for life, even if I didn't always sew that way. For sure. For sure. Yeah, I had... um a student recently, it's a grandmother, a granddaughter pair. And 
I was like, yes, go get this pattern. And it was my fault completely. I wasn't thinking to say, oh, you have to make sure on the front of the pattern that you're buying the right size. And so they just grabbed a pattern, but it was one for a small child, like toddler, um, rather than recognizing, like they knew how to look at the pattern on the back and it has the sizing chart, but they didn't realize that the, the, the front of the pattern will tell you what sizes are contained within that envelope. So yeah. they just had to go and exchange it, but it's definitely mm -hmm. so many things just reading a pattern, um, mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah. yeah. So after junior high, where did, where did sewing take you from there? Okay. I, I, I also remember in high school, I made a, like, uh, what do you call it? Like a baby pink denim jacket, which was, you know, back in those days, we're talking eighties, mid eighties, the only denim jackets people were wearing were just blue. And so I, I was working at a fabric store. It was my first job working at a fabric store that was in the mall, like who has fabric stores in the mall these days, right? So sewing was yeah. a little more common. And uh, I was working at the store and and got this idea for this denim jacket. And um, and so that, that was one thing. And then I made a prom dress, which was um, kind of exciting. I that brought that to show and tell today because it is kind of an, another funny part of my sewing journey, I guess. So I so before we were recording, I know you lifted up the prom dress, so we can totally go and talk. I want to see that. And what's the funny story behind it? Okay, you want me to tell you about this? So um, uh, you can probably tell it's taffeta, and it's a strapless um, taffeta. Uh, what do they call this? Rushing, or I can't remember ruching. when it's down. I say ruching. Yeah, down the side, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And then it's got this, because this is 80s, it's got this great big, you know, low dropped hip with this sash and then a teal taffeta skirt. Okay. So um, I had heard with my previous uh, sewing classes that if you're going to make something with taffeta and it's got boning and the whole, you know, zipper and the whole thing, um, you want to make a muslin mock-up. And so I was like, I know exactly what to do before I spend all that money on the fabric. I'm going to make the muslin mock up. So I did that and tried it on. It fit perfectly. And so then I went and bought the taffeta, I put together the whole dress and went to try it on. And it did not fit at all. Like, way too small. And I could not, I could not figure out why. And after all the hours that I put in right in high school, well, it's going to click when I tell you this is cut on the bias. And oh. so muslin cut on the bias and done up like this has a lot more give <laughs> a lot more stretch than taffeta. Right? So here I am like the proms in a couple days, I've spent the money, the time, what in the world do I do? And it's lined. And so I went over to a friend who I had babysat for this lady and she was a professional seamstress. So we ripped out the lining and you can, like, I could still see, I, we took this thing down to like, the seams were an eighth of an inch, you know, they're like tiny as tiny, like how tiny can we make these seams and uh, then cut down some of the lining. So for the bulk and all that, and we had to adjust the zipper, made everything as, as small as we could. And I was just poured into that and could not breathe the whole prom night. But um, I've saved the dress, you know, 30 some years. It, it, it was just so funny. And now I'm like, if you ever make a muslin mock-up. Make sure <laughs> that, you know, the, the thing you're going to use has the same amount of give. Yeah. But that was like my craziest. Um, it was bold to make a prom dress. <laughs> and then yes, I was sure. like, oh, I saved a lot of money, but it was a lot of stress. Yeah, I... Um that's not the first thing I would have thought of, right? For sure. Because obviously we think of like make the muslin mock-up. Um, but... Yeah, without seeing the pattern and thinking, oh, it's on the bias. And then, oh, yeah, that's, yeah. Wow, that would be a lot of stress coming right up yeah. to prom. Yeah, sure. it was, it was a funny, you know, like one of those things you'll just remember for the rest of your life. And it's past and I lived through it. It's all good. 
<laughs> oh, that's great. And so then after high school, you kept sewing. I mean, you certainly weren't discouraged by your um, prom dress experience. No. And, you know, a lot of the things that I made in high school, it was, it came from a, um, a need because, you know, everybody else was buying esprit and guest jeans and like all the different things. And we just financially couldn't afford it. So, you know, even then in those years when everybody else was wearing tapered jeans with a little tiny, you know, like a four inch, five inch ankle zipper, um, mm -hmm. I went to Sears and we just got plain jeans for me. And then I went to the fabric store and found some zippers and, and tapered my own jeans and put some zippers in at the ankles. And, um, I remember making sweatshirts with all the different color blocks and things like that in the eighties that were popular. And, uh, I worked at a fabric store, so I got a discount and, um, you know, that was, that was really helpful, um, to kind of anchor in that, this is how we can do life and, and sewing can be, um, save you a lot of, of money. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's a time investment, but it can save you a lot of money. Um, from then I, I got married and, uh, as I became a mom, well, first when I got married and started setting up a house, right. I was making curtains because I knew how, and curtains are simple, right. And, yes. and pillows and things like that for my house. And then when I became a mom, it was making clothes for my kids. For sure. I'm curious, um, talking about, I, I think we, oh, I mean, even for me growing up, um, it, it was cheaper, so to speak, to make your own. Like I was in some weddings for um, aunts and uncles and we would get the fabric and make them. How do you think you've seen that change though? compared to how it is now, I mean, so often the cost of fabric for a dress is almost as much as the dress to buy. Like, do you see that? Yeah, for in, sure. Um, they uh, call it fast fashion, right? Yeah. Is that what it's mm -hmm. called? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's hard. I don't even know if hard is the right way to shift that mindset because uh, even my mom, she will make a lot of her clothes still because she definitely grew up in that, like didn't have a lot of money. And it is, it's an interesting dynamic when you see how much fabric costs compared to how much fast fashion costs. And yet the, um, so then you kind of lose the skill and the value of what it takes to make clothing because it's so cheap. When right. I, I, I think I'm, still grateful for the basic skills I've okay. learned, right? Because even if you buy something through fast fashion or thrifting, and we do a Ooh. lot of that in our house. Yeah. I, I'm a Me mom too. of nine, right? Yes. We've got five girls and uh, no, we don't. We have four, four girls. We have five boys. <laughs> but anyway, um, I remember like when they have like a formal event and we go to a thrift store or buy something on Amazon, it's always got to be altered. And yeah. so um, that that's like those necessary skills. If I didn't know how to put in some of those tucks and French seams or, you know, things like that, then I would not have the skills to be able to adjust. And I think some of that um, fast fashion comes maybe um, – maybe with some seams that need a little bit of attention, even out the gate. And yes. then when I'm buying things at thrift stores, it needs a little attention. Yeah. Um, I remember sure. my daughter was in a wedding and, and they just had to have a certain color and they could go get whatever. And uh, she had this dress, but it was, it, it wasn't the right fit. And she was like, I know mom, you can do this and this. And I was thinking we do this thing to it. And, and I was like, okay, but don't touch it until this weekend. Cause I don't have time to deal with it, but this weekend we'll work on it and make your changes. And, uh, I woke up the next morning and <laughs> she had taken the scissors to it <gasps> and she had cut all these pieces. And she was like, well, I was thinking that I was going to do this and this. And I was like, but you don't have the basic, like you don't know that you needed some extra space so that we could put those things together. And um, she has now learned to sew, but it was so funny, you know, at the moment, you know, it's just like, 
I want to see the end product and I know what I want the Mm -hmm. end product to look like, but, um, all the steps to get there were a little obscure to her. So, um, yeah, that, that was a fun season. Were you able to save the dress? Like, could she wear it? Okay. I was able to save the dress, but we fudged on several of our family modesty rules for that wedding and, and said, it's not like to the standard that we would normally have you wear. It's shorter, it's lower cut. It's all the things that, you know, she was 16, 17. I think she was 16 in this wedding. And, and we said, you know, you get to wear the dress once, but it will not be a repeated um, a dress. So sure. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I remember distinctly, this was quite a number of years ago. So now I do a lot more like bridal and formal wear, but this was like um, back when I was taking a lot more regular alterations and I'm trying to remember the exact scenario, but it was a teenager that came in with her grandmother and she had all these jeans and she, I don't remember if it was more space, but literally they just, she had already taken the scissors to the waistband to accomplish what she wanted. And I was like, oh, that's not where we start when we're sewing <laughs> If you could have just waited a little bit, there was a better way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Oh, that's funny. Yeah, yeah but so... I find that, go ahead. No, you, go ahead. <laughs> um, I find that uh, most of the sewing I have done since being a mom, you know, when they were little, I I made some matching clothes like father-son shirts, but those are becoming available now. And um, I made some, some just unique pieces, little dresses for my girls. And honestly, my granddaughter is wearing some of the dresses that I made for my daughter, which is just fun to have some heirloom pieces, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, but my, my sewing has kind of moved less of the everyday wear and more to the specialty items like costumes that I might not be able to find or as my children were in ballet or theater, mm-hmm. then it would be, are there any moms who know how to sew because we have this costume we need to do, or we have an alteration for before mm-hmm. a recital. And so I think just by the nature of me being busy, my time being limited, I I didn't have the time to just make the everyday items so much as the specialty items as needed. Yeah, for sure. Um, I would say that's pretty calm, right? Because it's yeah. all about the seasons of what age and stage your kids are at. And I hear that pretty frequently that women will sew when their kids are young because it's fun to make all the little clothes. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Um, yeah. So I'm also curious now that we've been talking so much about all that you've been sewing, what kind of a machine, what what kind of machine do you have? Hmm. Well, you know, the very first machine I got was at, I think, Joanne Fabrics, you know, in the mid 80s. And I just bought it off the shelf, you know, at the store. And eventually um, I got one at Costco and my I gave my mom my hand me down machine. And so I upgraded. Um, Honestly, I can't even remember what the brand name is um, because currently it's in the cupboard. Like the truth is it's in the cupboard and I'm so busy with other hobbies. Like right now it's more digital with the podcasting Mm -hmm. and things like that. But every year at Christmas, I end up bringing it out um, as we have a new grandbaby or a new daughter, son-in-law, whatever. I need to make them a stocking that matches with our family um, thing. Um, Mm -hmm. Back when I was in high school, I made myself a stocking out of muslin. And I just had a, like the band was Mm -hmm. one fabric. And then I did like this cutout angel on the front. And then when I got married, I made my husband a muslin stocking with, you know, his different accent fabric and a tree on the front. And then as each one of our babies, I came, I did like a muslin background with some sort of accent that was like their personality or something I thought was like fun with their name or something. Well, I've kept with that. And so everybody has that same background. You know how um, the styles of fabric change through the years and the the style of things. So over these 30 years, I've kind of kept the same with the muslin and then the accents have kind of changed, but they all kind of go together. They all 
kind of match in a way. So every year I pull out the machine and I make the new stockings if we need to. And my daughter makes her own stockings, but she always shows up at my house and says, can we get your machine out? And can you do it for me since I have babies to take care of? So, um, so there's some of that. I don't, I can't even think I also have a serger, um, but I can't remember the name of that. Um, And I don't use that as much, you know, that was, again, it's helpful when I'm mending something or trying to cut down the bulk through surging Mm -hmm. when there's like a seam on, on a costume or something. Yeah. Do you, um, have any specific like sewing machine frustrations or challenges that have occurred over your, uh, sewing journey? Well, you know, I, I probably should do better with maintenance to tell you the truth. Um, it, it, that is hard. I want to learn how to oil and like Mm. tune up my own machine. I really should be, but I just haven't been good about that. And then, you know, you don't want to put the money in to pay for a tune up if you don't use it very often, because by the time you go to use it again, it's all dried up and you're like, now I got to take it in. So that is kind of something where I wish I was better at knowing how to do that. And, um, my serger is probably 25 years old at this point. And I'm kind of, you know, rolling the dice Mm -hmm. thinking, do I use it or is it just time to retire this thing? You know, is it, is it salvageable? So I use it very little. That would probably be my machine story. I find that, um, I have serger and I, I hate threading it, mm. the whole thing, right? Yeah. Um, I always, I, even though it's always out, um, if I have to rethread all of the under yeah. threads, oh, I, I don't it's a love steep that. learning curve. Like that's, and I just, every one of them is so different. And I feel like, I mean, I'm much better about it, but like I always crisscross the the threads on the bottom and so the first time I try it after I rethread it they'll break and then I have to rethread it again yes and I mean you don't you tell ever all the children do not do not walk near the serger don't touch it don't touch any of the strings don't you no you're not using it you know as my as my girls have learned to sew I'm like you can actually I ended up buying them their own machine because I, I'm like, I want my machine to be in good working order. When I go to use it, you girls have your own machine there, but the serger is off limits completely. That's going to be me. Oh, that's funny. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, so one final story that I'm curious about, because I remember that we spoke about it when I was on your podcast, there was something about your daughter, one of your little ones that you made a blog post about. What was that story again? Okay. So that is my, my youngest daughter. And she is the most creative little girl that I I just, she blows my mind with her creativity. Um, She had had a little um, stuffed dog, if I remember right. She'd had a stuffed dog that she kept putting on my desk next to my sewing machine. Will you fix it for me? It's um, its snout had gotten chewed off by our puppy. And so she wanted me to fix the stuffed animal's face. And I'm looking at this thinking it's not repairable. And if I just leave it there long enough, she will forget about it and I can throw it in the garbage can. And, and so I just kept putting it off and putting it off. And I had not taught this little girl how to sew at all. I'm thinking she is about seven. And I walked in the room one day, and those are the pictures that are on my blog post, I think. Um, I walked into the room and she's sitting on the floor and she has a needle and thread and scissors and, and a teddy bear. And I'm like, what are you doing? Well, she had found a teddy bear of similar color that she didn't like anymore. And she was doing a reconstructive nose surgery on her dog. And so she cut the muzzle off of this teddy bear And took it and placed it over the front of her dog that she did like and wanted fixed. And she had figured out how to thread a needle, how to, and she was sewing the snout on and she did an amazing job. I was like, 
I can hardly tell that it was changed. And I was like, you did this all by yourself. I cannot believe it. You know, just the creativity of that child. And then I was thinking, okay, it's probably time that I, I work on teaching her how to sew. I hadn't really thought she was interested. I didn't really know that she had an aptitude for it. And so since then, well, we moved from Oregon to Tennessee and I did not want to leave behind all my fabric, but I don't have a lot of time to sew. Well, since we got here, I've just said, if you want to make anything, you're welcome to, which is, you know, as a, as a seamstress, right? Like you're welcome to all my scraps of fat, all my fabric stuff. And, but, but I go look down there and she is just, she just does it creatively creatively. Mm -hmm. We have not practiced patterns. We haven't learned that kind of thing with her, but she, when she has an interest to make something, she just does it. And I love to see her do that. It's really fun. That is so sweet. That is so sweet. Well, thanks for sharing that story. (laughs) I had completely forgotten about that. That's a, it's a good memory. Yes, for sure. For sure. And good inspiration to, um, yeah, think outside the box about you fixing those stuffed animals. (laughs) Isn't that crazy? <laughs> I would never would have thought. <laughs> right, right. Um, so tell us, Pam, where can listeners find you? And what's the best way to reach out to you if they want to keep in touch? Sure. Uh, my Instagram handle is Tending Fields. And I uh, also have a website called tendingfields.net. And I like to talk about motherhood and encourage moms in their journey of parenting. And then I have a podcast called The Mom Next Door Stories of Faith, where I interview people like yourself and just kind of listen to what has made you tick through the years and how the Lord has has worked in your life. So I I love being there. I have a mom's group on Facebook called Tending Fields, and that's just a place of encouragement uh, because, you know, when when you've got your sleeves rolled up and you're in the trenches, so to say, it's just, it's great to have some camaraderie there. For sure. For sure. Well, thank you so much for joining me and um, look forward to connecting with you more online. Yeah, this was so much fun. Thanks for having me.